I'd like to formally welcome you to today's first episode of EOS Support Webinar Series hosted by the American Partnership for Eosinophilic Disorders. My name is Jennifer Roeder. I am a communications consultant for AppFed. And joining me today is Dr. Wendy Buck. Dr. Book is the president of AppFed. She has been involved in a volunteer capacity on the executive board, serving as the president since 2009. She has led education, advocacy, research, and awareness efforts in, that have led to the creation of the National Eosinophil Awareness Week, the NIH Report Language, NIH Task Force on the Research Needs for Eosinophil Associated Diseases, also known as TRED. She's helped with insurance coverage of medical foods, the development of ICD-9 CM codes for eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases. She's assisted in the development of AppFed's Hope on the Horizon Research Grant Program, which has directed more than $2.3 million to research efforts to date. Her efforts have led to collaborations with other patient advocacy groups, physicians, medical societies, and federal agencies. Her experience as a parent of a chronically ill child and as a physician provides a unique perspective on the patient experience and challenges involved in navigating the medical system. So without further ado, I'll hand things off to Dr. Buck. Great, thank you. I'm gonna uh, share my screen here. I'm gonna make sure everybody can see it. All right. All right, well, it is uh, a pleasure to be able to share some of our family's personal experience with all of you today. Um, I am a parent of a child with the eosinophilic esophagitis, and I myself am on parenteral nutrition, and our family just loves to travel. Uh, by way of disclaimer, I must say that we have not been traveling given, given the pandemic over the last 18 months, but we are really looking forward to getting back to it as soon as we are able to do so. We, uh, the information I'm going to share with you today is largely based on our personal experience, but with that personal experience has come advice from other patients, other families, from home health care companies from a variety of web-based resources. In other words, the community has helped our family uh, successfully travel with significant dietary restrictions, tube feeds, and parental nutrition. And I'm hoping to share some of what I've learned with all of you. And when I'm done today, I am hoping those of you uh, on this call will in addition share what has worked for you and your family. Just as uh, by way of background, uh, this is my son. He was sick from the time he was a very young baby. I remember uh, attending a, a conference at Disney when he was just a few weeks old and uh, spending a good bit of time at one, two in the morning walking around with him. He was miserable. We didn't really understand what was wrong with him until he was two and was diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis. He ended up on an elemental diet at age three and got a G-tube at age four. And we were determined that he would have uh, all the opportunities possible in spite of the challenges that he was dealing with. Um, that's him uh, in Hawaii, uh, Machu Picchu, uh, Turks and Caicos, and in Alaska. And we have managed to, to go all of these places, although with a great bit of planning. The second part of our story is related to me. I developed a non eosinophil related GI issue and ended up with a G-tube, a G-J-tube, a J-tube, and eventually ended up on parenteral nutrition in 2017. And this really added to uh, the challenges of traveling with the family due to the amount of medical equipment that had to come with us in tow. I continue to work. I was working at the time that I went on parenteral nutrition. And that uh, picture in the upper left is what a typical day's worth of stuff going to work with me would look like. And I wear, I use my TPN during the day and I keep it in a fanny pack. It goes everywhere with me during the day. So while I'm at work, I'm infusing. And this gave me a little bit of confidence, I think, in terms of traveling because I was 
getting a little practice run going to work for the day and back. I did continue to travel for work, although I was pretty limited in terms of how long I could travel for work just due to logistics of getting things from point A to point B. And I'm happy to discuss that further if anyone has a particular interest in uh, that area, uh, we, we can discuss that in more detail. Uh, but more fun, I have traveled with my family and we have gone as many places uh, as we are able to. And we've dragged all the medical supplies and specialty foods and formula and everything we need along with us. And in the middle, that's me dropping my son Ryan off for a semester abroad in France. Uh, and that was in 2020. So it ended up being half of a semester abroad in France. And that's us uh, visiting a castle in Europe. And I, you can see I'm on infusion at the time that we were walking around there. We have found that planning planning, 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 and then some more planning is really important to having a true relaxing and successful trip. And that starts with uh, where you're going to go, how you're going to get there, and how long you're going to be there. It is easiest if you have a lot of medical supplies to take with you to travel by car, but it is also possible to travel by plane domestically or even internationally with a good bit of planning. You have to be realistic about what is possible for you and your family and plan a trip that, that will be feasible. Uh, for instance, I personally have no great desire to go camping in the mountains for a week and I probably would find it very difficult logistically to do that. There are ways to do that if that's something you want to do but think through your trip in terms of how long you'll be away, do you have enough supplies, how will you get your supplies there, how will you refrigerate uh, items that need to be refrigerated, how will you cook, uh, can you find a place with a kitchen. We're, uh, we love the Airbnbs, but we've also stayed in hotels and made that work too. Sometimes it's helpful to be able to ship supplies ahead when I travel for work. It is really difficult for me to carry everything with me that I need to take with me uh, when I'm traveling alone. So I will often pack up supplies and ship them ahead to the hotel. If you're going to do this, it does help to call the hotel for detailed instructions as to what to write on the package, how far ahead can it be received by the hotel, and be prepared when you check in and for me it's usually at night the front desk uh, staff may have no idea where your package is it doesn't mean it's lost they just don't know where it is and give them a little time they always find it uh, but that is one option uh, sometimes your home health company can help you out so for those on parental nutrition you can ask your home health company to split your weekly shipment uh, to be delivered to your uh, hotel so that you don't have to have it delivered to you, pack it up and then ship to the hotel. And I've done that on occasion. Uh, most of the time um, I go ahead and, and ship myself. International travel is a little uh, more challenging logistically. It may not be realistic to ship medical supplies overseas. Can it be done? Yes. Is it expensive? Very. And then you have to worry about, will you be able to get your supplies out of customs on the other side? So we have not shipped anything internationally for uh, travel purposes. I am aware on occasion, some people do. And when you're planning your trip internationally, think about whether or not you speak the language. If you don't, how will you communicate food allergies? Um, dietary restrictions and medical needs at your destination. So these are some of the things to think about many, many months in advance of your trip. Uh, how will you get there? How will you get your medical supplies and your food there? And how will you store it and prepare it once you arrive? I'm a big believer in checklists, um, fairly uh, 
detailed checklists, uh, my personal checklist of packing uh, supplies that I pack is four pages long. Uh, before you go, it helps to check in with your healthcare team. Um, schedule your appointments several months in advance, discuss your upcoming trip, where you're going to go, what your plans are. I have a travel letter from my doctor that gets updated prior to each trip. And that's very important for me traveling with parenteral nutrition. Talk to your healthcare team about what you need to bring with you. Depending on where you're going, you may need some emergency medical supplies to come with you. If you're going to be in a big city uh, where medical care is readily available, you may not need that. So talk to your healthcare team and your home health company when you're planning your trip in those planning stages. And again, think through how long are you gonna be gone? What will you eat? What might you need? Is that care available when you get there? Make a detailed list of what you need to bring with you. Do you need food? Do you need snacks? Um, do you need your pump? Do you need a charger for your pump? I've been in the unfortunate situation of traveling to New York City and leaving the, the charger for my uh, feeding pump in Atlanta. Um, it's much easier to just make sure charger is on the list and checked off than it is to find somebody who's willing to bail you out uh, when you arrive at your destination. And think through your contingency plans. So what about, you know, you're going to go to uh, visit New York City and it turns out for some reason you can't get the one food you're able to eat while you're there. So think through these things. What is your backup plan? Uh, will you be able to find what you need and purchase it on arrival or do you need to bring it with you? If you're traveling particularly internationally, think about whether or not you're going to need medical evacuation insurance. It's very expensive to take an air ambulance back home. And if you think that might be something you need, research the types of travel insurance that are available, figure out what your health insurance covers, make sure you have trip insurance, and there are websites that can help you sort through all this. When I travel, I carry a one page summary that has my entire medical history summarized, allergies, emergency contacts, all my doctors that are relevant and their phone numbers and my, my medication list. And I carry one uh, when we travel with our son, he carries the same. I have it in uh, multiple copies. I keep it in different bags. This is kind of my go-to if an emergency occurs, I can easily produce that in the emergency department. Um, this uh, picture here is uh, my family or my husband and son when we were in Paris. My husband who uh, does not need to carry a summary of anything with him, he's the healthy one. On day one, took a tumble down a spiral staircase slammed into a stone wall and shattered his clavicle. So that was a little stressful, as you can imagine, and we got to visit an emergency room in Paris. So always be prepared. We were prepared because we, we think through these disaster scenarios, not that particular one, um, but always be prepared about where you're gonna go if something happens and how you're going to communicate when you get there. Uh, emergency medicines obviously always are carried with you. I'm not, if you have food allergies, you carry your EpiPen wherever you go and the airplane is no exception. You do want to be prepared to treat a medical emergency in flight. The availability to treat medical emergencies in flight is really limited. So of course, do your homework and make sure you and your doctor are uh, have provided you with what you need to deal with in a medical emergency should it occur. Um, this is less of a concern if you're traveling domestically and uh, more of a concern if this occurs halfway over the Atlantic Ocean, for instance. Mm -hmm. 
For those traveling with dietary restrictions and food allergies, there are so many resources out there. I, I cannot do them justice. There are many, many resources available. There are restaurant apps um, for uh, just about anywhere that will help you not only with the menu for that restaurant, but looking at ingredients and looking for top food allergens in those ingredients in, the, uh, in those particular restaurants. There are food allergy cards that are available on multiple websites. The ones that I like the best have pictures on them. If you're traveling internationally, one that you can translate is helpful as well. Uh, we made our own uh, when we traveled um, because our son has some very bizarre uh, food allergies and they were not available on these websites. Most people are, don't have to avoid rice, for instance. So we created our own cards that were unique to his situation, but there are many that are available uh, on the internet that will cover the vast majority of allergies. I always keep a copy uh, on paper and a uh, copy on my phone. That way I can always find it if I leave one or the other elsewhere. Again, planning is really important. Um, my son can't eat fish or rice. So having a plan to go to uh, Asia, to an island, for instance, we're probably gonna be just what food is available on site. So we have not made that trip. Uh, we have brought his favorite food, sun butter, everywhere we go. We've traveled everywhere with uh, sun butter and lentil crackers. That's his go-to snack uh, when we travel. So be realistic about what you might find at your destination and make sure you have sufficient food with you if you don't think you can find what you need at your destination. Sometimes it's hard to know what you're gonna be able to find and what you're not gonna be able to find. I always err on the side of caution and assume I can't find it. And if we are able to find those allergen-free foods elsewhere, I'm, I just consider that a bonus. The downside of all this, of course, is the food takes up precious real estate and luggage. And that is uh, unfortunately sometimes can't be avoided. Those who are on tube feeding or are on an elemental diet that's consumed orally, uh, I think the challenges are similar in terms of getting your medical foods to your destination. Uh, obviously, traveling by car is the easiest thing to do. Traveling by plane uh, adds a level of challenge. If there is a powder formula option that is good enough for uh, travel, that's great. Um, our son uh, would use Elicare Jr. And as he got older, Vivanex, which comes in single-use uh, packets that could be mixed on the go on the plane, for instance. And that was kind of his backup plan for travel. Um, for those who are consuming the elemental formula orally, those might not be good options. And you may have your medical foods in a liquid form that has to come with you. If that's the case, a good discussion with your doctor and your home healthcare company to obtain the documentation you need explaining that this medical food is medically necessary for your child's condition X um, can help you as you're getting through security and customs. Think about if you will need refrigeration at your destination. Uh, the beauty of single use powdered formula is you don't have to worry about refrigerating extra. You can just mix what you need when you need it. Uh, that is not realistic for many people on elemental formula and using medical foods. So think through the refrigeration at your destination. Tube dislodgement uh, is always a concern. Uh, 
I would encourage anyone who has a feeding tube to know how to replace it if they need to in general and bring spare tubes with you when you travel. We have uh, between my son and I three tubes, so we bring three spare tubes when we travel, just in case. Uh, think through your plan for pump failure. If you are on a uh, feeding pump, what happens if you have pump failure? What is your backup plan? Um, we bring uh, the old fashioned kangaroo drip chamber bags that have a roller clamp on them. That's our back backup plan. They can be rinsed and reused and you can slow the drip rate. It's not precise, it's not accurate. It probably would not work for an infant, uh, but for an older child or an adult, it is a reasonable um, emergency plan. And I just throw a couple of those bags in the suitcase and hope that I never have to open them, but it gives me peace of mind to know that it's there. Think through everything else you might need in your travels. Uh, those of us dealing with kids with EGID, you know they throw up a lot. So do you have emesis bags? Change of clothes, not just for the kid, but for the whole family. Uh, we used to joke, our poor child here, used to joke that he would, that he had vomited everywhere, that no place had been spared. He vomited in the pyramids of Egypt. It was just kind of how it was uh, before he got on the right medicine for him. So we went everywhere with a backpack and a change of clothes and emesis bags. And we travel with hydration salts as kind of an emergency backup plan as well. Uh, these can be purchased um, online and mixed with water and they're a great bailout plan for acute illness and dehydration uh, if you do not have availability for IV hydration. International travel is uh, logistically even more challenging than domestic travel for all the reasons you think. Um, the language barrier, the uh, limited uh, food availability, specialty food availability, um, difficulty in knowing whether or not you can find safe foods at a restaurant, all of those um, things add to the challenge and getting your luggage with all the medical supplies and medical foods overseas is also a huge challenge. Um, again, if you're making food allergy cards, pictures go a long way, and then the language of your destination. I can tell you we tried this in Italy, and uh, it the waiter at at the waiters at the restaurant didn't really understand and it really uh, it, it, you know it helps sometimes sometimes maybe not so much so think through those things again have a backup plan if plan a doesn't work i have my medical summary translated before we go on any major trip at least the highlights if i end up in an emergency room um, in a foreign country i want to be sure that the critical pieces of my uh, medical history are available when i travel on parenteral nutrition um, I label all of the medical supplies in my luggage and I pack them uh, in day packs. So I have a Monday pack that has everything I need for Monday, a Tuesday pack that way I can just pull it out of the luggage for that day without opening up everything. Um, I double bag everything and label them as medical supplies and medically necessary. If I'm traveling abroad, I will label them in English and the language of the country we are traveling to. I assume that TSA will indeed go through my suitcase and go through my luggage and go through my medical supplies. And that's why I double bag everything and clearly label every single bag as being medically necessary. 
I always bring a few extra days worth of medical supplies and medical food. Um, you never know what's going to happen when you're going to get stuck in an airport for two or three days. You just don't know. So make sure you have um, enough extra with you to, to survive. Um, battery backup for pumps, for the pumps for which that's available is really, really helpful. Uh, I have used this on more than one occasion. Uh, a backup pump uh, is also helpful. Those who are dependent on IV nutrition uh, theoretically should have a backup pump uh, at home and should bring that when they travel. Um, gravity feeds are an option for pump failure for uh, those with a G-tube or an NG-tube uh, and also an option for IV hydration for those um, on parental nutrition. Okay. Uh, always talk with your home health company about what you might need, what that backup option might look like and make sure you have your, your emergency option available. And again, whenever possible, replacing liquids with powders when traveling by airplane really um, makes your, your ability to get through security smoother. Um, as I said, my uh, son spent a semester abroad in France. Uh, this is him on spring break in Greece just before the pandemic uh, really, really broke out. Uh, this is one of the last trips he was able to take. It can be done, it's nerve wracking, uh, but with a lot of planning, you know, anything is possible. One of the challenges for him was getting everything there. Uh, we did have the resources, fortunately, to be able to travel with him to France. So we were able to carry a good bit uh, of luggage with us, which makes a big difference. The medications, uh, I'm sure those of you who travel are well aware, always pack those in your carry-on. You don't want to check those in your luggage. In the case of a semester abroad, this is what his medications look like when he got there and unpacked. Uh, quite a few, as you can imagine. Work with your doctor. Make sure you have enough prescription medicine for the entire semester. And I was told, you know, once at the beginning of uh, our dealing with all of these things that if you're traveling internationally, you have to have a copy of the prescription for each of your medicines, for your parental nutrition, um, some documentation for your medical food. And I have, I still bring it with me. I keep a copy in each bag, in fact. Um, I have only once been asked for it and that was in London they matched the labels to the prescription of every single thing that went through uh, security that was medical related. So it is helpful to have it. Um, that is uh, the screening process differs by country and by airport, frankly, in the United States, very different screening process. So being prepared to provide that documentation can, can help. Again, with the semester abroad, you, you do want to be sure you have a plan for emergencies. How will you receive care at your destination? Uh, typically, the school that is sponsoring the semester abroad will have recommendations and contacts for uh, doctors in the area, as well as recommendations for hospitals uh, if emergency care is needed. And of course, backed up emergency medicines are helpful to take with you. The specialty foods, medical foods can be a little challenging. When Ryan went to France, we brought a large amount of lentil pasta and lentil rice. He lives on lentils. And it turns out in France, they eat a lot of lentils. So we didn't really need to bring any of it because it was all there already in the supermarket. Uh, figure it out as best you can before you go and always err on the side of bringing what you think you'll need is kind of the way we have approached um, long-term trip abroad. And again, make sure your 
college student knows where to go, who to call if something happens. Uh, you will be here in the States, you will be not in a position to help them and they need to be independent. That's the whole point of semester abroad is to uh, really develop that independence. Talking about it before they go can help them feel prepared. I'm going to briefly touch on parenteral nutrition. I don't think this is as common a scenario as uh, food allergies, restricted diets, and elemental diets. If you're on parenteral nutrition, you can travel. You can travel by air. It's, it requires um, really detailed planning uh, to successfully uh, make your trip and make sure you have everything when you arrive. My advice is to find a really, really good cooler. I mean, that makes all the difference, having a good cooler to get your TPN from point A to point B. I like this little Coleman cooler. I own two of them. It fits in the overhead bin. It will keep uh, TPN cold for 24 hours, maybe a little longer sometimes. And uh, I bring two of these for a week. So that's my uh, IV hydration and additives, all that fills two coolers um, for a week away. I have bought a number of thermometers that I keep in the coolers and I track the temperature for on a long trip or if we have an airport delay, I make sure I have enough ice packs, not just to get to my destination, but also uh, in case I end up needing to use the cooler as a refrigerator for a longer period of time than I planned. Um, this picture here is us uh, arriving um, somewhere in Europe after a really long, long flight. And I am in a hotel lobby waiting for a room. And in that area, I have to mix and hook up my TPN. If you're on parenteral nutrition, it is much easier to stay in a, a place that has either a full kitchen or has a decent sized refrigerator. Uh, it is possible to stay in hotels. It helps to call ahead if possible, but you may not be able to get the information you need, even if you try. Uh, hotel refrigerators, as you know, can be very small. Uh, obviously call ahead, let them know you need a refrigerator for uh, medical supplies. And it helps to make it clear that an emptied um, mini bar is not good enough. Those do not get cold enough to store uh, either medical foods that are open or um, IV supplies. So it helps to put that out there. Uh, you may do all this, arrive at your destination and find out there is no refrigerator option after all. Uh, and that has happened to us on more than one occasion. Um, we, it's probably not wise, nor will most hotels offer to put medical supplies in the kitchen refrigerator in the hotel. Uh, so what we have asked them to do is to freeze those ice packs from the cooler and rotate the ice packs and monitor the temperature. So it kind of functions as an auxiliary refrigerator. Without my coolers, I couldn't do anything. I'm, you know, my coolers are my favorite possession uh, at this point. If you don't want to deal with IV uh, compounded parenteral nutrition and all that's needed to keep that cold and stored on your trip. Shelf stable Clinimix uh, and it is an option for uh, longer trips or as an alternative to compounded TPN. It can go in your check luggage. You don't have to refrigerate it at your destination. Um, it's a great option if you're gonna be gone more than seven days. Um, or if you wanted to go, for instance, on safari in Africa. Uh, if you're going to pursue this option, you need to talk to your doctor, talk to your home health company. They may want you to do a trial of the shelf stable TPN and get your blood work done on it to make sure it's going to be an option for you. I personally don't feel as well on it and I have not 
gone on any trips that are uh, so long that I, I can't use compounded TPN for most of the trip. Uh, but something to talk to your home health company about or your doctor about. Uh, every single bag that's in my cooler is labeled and double bag that's labeled as sterile medical equipment, medically necessary in as many languages as is necessary for the destination. And the reason I double bag it is I know when I drag a cooler of liquids through security at the airport, it will be pulled and searched. And just because it's a sterile medical supply doesn't mean that TSA can't and won't do their job. Their job is to keep us safe. So they will pull and search the bags. And I know they will touch things in there. So I make sure everything is clearly labeled and double bagged to minimize chance of contamination. Similarly, if I'm on my pump while going through security, and I, I try not to be, but if the timing doesn't work out, I have that labeled as um, medically necessary and sterile medical equipment. I keep a, uh, the TPN and pump in a clear Ziploc bag and I take it out of my fanny pack to go through security so that TSA can clearly see what is in there. I personally have found TSA cares to be very helpful when we're traveling by plane. Uh, you can go to the TSA website and there is an option to contact TSA cares and ask for an assist at the airport. The assistance is dependent on staffing. They can't always help you. But in that communication, I let them know my flight number, the day, the time, where I'm leaving from, where I'm going. And I also let them know exactly what I'll be carrying through security. So that documentation is there. I bring the travel letter from my doctor, which states what supplies need to be on the plane with me and why. And I bring a copy of my TPN prescription. And again, uh, for those traveling with an IV line, medical evacuation insurance is really critical as is a treatment plan for emergencies. So I'm gonna end here and just leave you with these thoughts. Research your destination, your trip. Think through uh, when you're on a restricted diet, you need to think through what am I gonna have for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks? What am I gonna drink? Will it be there? If it's not gonna be there, how will I get it there? Um, plan and then make a contingency plan and then make another contingency plan. A detailed packing and to-do list can help. Uh, when we travel, we travel with an enormous amount of medical equipment and specialty foods. And we have gotten real good, and we being my poor family, uh, at packing our clothes into the teeniest little package. And most of the supplies going with us are medical related supplies. The clothes just simply don't always fit. Um, sometimes if we're taking a longer trip, I will pack uh, well in advance of the trip and make sure all the bags are gonna fit in the car. These are just some of the logistics uh, we think through on that uh, planning list, packing list, uh, and to-do list. Always, of course, work with your doctor and home health provider. They can be great resources. There are many patient advocacy groups out there that are terrific resources for um, traveling with medical issues. And when you're done planning, um, plan some more, just to be sure. Uh, there, I cannot do all the resources justice that are out here, so I've just picked a couple, but by no means is this everything that's available. Uh, EPFED has a page on travel. Um, FAIR Food Allergy Group has a um, page on traveling uh, domestically as well as internationally. Uh, OLI, which focuses on tube feeding and parenteral nutrition, has travel tips for both enteral and parenteral nutrition. Um, TSA.gov can help with the TSA CARES resource if you're traveling by air and have specialty needs for screening. Uh, Insuremytrip.com will compare 
trip insurance um, policies for you. You kind of put in what you need to know and it will compare the policies, uh, pay attention, of course, to the pre-existing condition uh, clauses and what's required of you for that to be covered. Uh, pay attention to medical evacuation uh, coverage and make sure it's adequate. It's very, very expensive um, to be evacuated by air ambulance. Um, typically, these uh, travel insurance, if you have a pre existing condition, they'll require you to purchase the insurance within a week or two weeks um, from the time you make your first payment on the trip. So they want to know that you were medically stable to travel at the time you purchased your trip. Um, and I think it's been well worth it. Uh, personally, we thank God have not had to use the medevac insurance. Um, your home health company is also a great resource. They have certainly worked with other people in similar situations who are traveling. And I'm gonna stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, like the rest of you. I'm very much looking forward to the pandemic ending and looking forward to getting back out there in the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Book. That was such a wealth of information to, to help so many people traveling in so many different situations. We can see how much, much planning has gone into all your wonderful trips. Yes. But we have some really good questions coming in. And uh, one of the first ones that caught my eye is uh, people want to know if you can share the link to the cooler that uh, you use. Do you know if it's available on Amazon that we could uh, chat out the link to, to help people that are interested in uh, getting that same cooler? It is available on Amazon and I will figure out how to get that link out to everyone. Fantastic. All righty, a few other questions that have come in, let's see. When you work with your doctors to have a travel letter, what guidance or request do you give to them about what to include in it and how far in advance should you request it? You froze there, Jen, could you repeat that question? So sorry. Absolutely. When you are working with your healthcare team to gather a letter before you travel, what do you ask them to put in it? And how far in advance do you request it? Um, I usually request it several months in advance. Um, the, uh, if travel is going to be new for you and your family uh, in terms of the experience with that particular doctor, I think it helps to go in for an in-person visit to discuss your plans. When I ask for the letter, I uh, do as much as possible to ask for it in writing and uh, ask the doctor to put in there um, that, uh, for instance, my letter says something along the lines of, I uh, have intestinal failure, I'm dependent on X, Y, and Z to sustain life, and the following supplies need to come on the airplane with me up to and including plus maybe more, right? And it lists out the tubing and the uh, TPN and all of that and keep it really focused on what the screener needs at the airport from me, uh, as opposed to using it for any other purpose. The one page summary I put together in terms of what an ER doctor would want to know. And your doctor can help you with that by maybe even just providing a copy of your last visit note. Um, that you could carry with you to show an emergency room doctor if something were to happen. Do you use a template for that or is that something you created yourself? Um, I uh, created the one page summary myself. The letter template I got from somewhere, perhaps Oli, maybe Oli that I got it from, or maybe my home health company. 
When you are traveling, you've obviously traveled to a number of different countries. Have you found that uh, healthcare providers in other countries are familiar with EGIDs and with food allergies? Um, I, I assume that they're not um, familiar with it. Uh, and I think we have more awareness here in the United States of food allergies, particularly from restaurants um, and uh, takeout, for instance, you, you can find information on ingredients here, I think, more easily than you can in some other countries. So I, I don't think there's as much awareness, and it's really on, on you as the consumer to protect yourself and be prepared and have a bailout plan. Makes a lot of sense. Education is critical. When you are dealing with TSA agents, and even though you have everything labeled as medical necessities and sterile everything, do they generally let liquid come through for medical reasons if you don't have the powdered kind? Uh, yes and no. So uh, they are doing their job. And I must say with the TSA CARES Assist, I have not had any problems getting everything through. You do have to undergo additional screening. That is not something I've ever asked to opt out of. Um, they will take stuff out of the bag and swab it and look through it. Uh, the TSA CARES Assist helps because they understand travelers with medical conditions and understand what the processes are for screening those travelers. Um, the TSA agents that have not gone through that special training to assist travelers with medical conditions, they, they simply don't know. And it may take more time. Uh, it may be more difficult to uh, help them understand what's going on uh, the, uh, in, when you're going through, you know, security with ports and tubes that all the alarms go off, right? They, they're like, get her, right? <laughs> so I, I've had mostly good experiences. I did have one bad experience where the TSA agent would not let me go through the metal detector at all and left me on the other side of it. And my family had to go retrieve a manager to resolve the problem. So I was sitting on the floor outside the screening for a, a very long, what felt like a long period of time. I'm sure it wasn't as long as it felt. Uh, with my bags, you know, being gone through on the other side without me. So there were some process failures there and, and that can happen. You know, people are uh, maybe new at their job, they may not understand. Uh, and that's why I use that TSA care service because that's they are trained. That sounds like a, a helpful service. Um, a follow-up question came in. Do you find that certain times of day um, are easier to fly than others that you know TSA might have more time or be more patient or anything? Uh, I travel in and out of Atlanta and it is um, packed all the time. But there is no good time to fly out of Atlanta. It's always busy. They're always screening like hundreds, thousands of people. Um, so uh, if there are fewer people, sure, that, that's easier. Uh, and that's been the case in some of the smaller airports around the country. It is easier to get through if they're not dealing with large numbers and large crowds. Makes sense. So one of our participants today has never heard of single-use formula and they're interested in more information about it because they had an unfortunate situation where security once threw out uh, their son's sunbather that was in their carry-on luggage. They said, luckily they had some more in their checked-in baggage, but they're interested in more information about single-use formula. Yes, um, I don't know what is available for young children. Um, so the Bivanex is an adult elemental formula, for instance, that comes in single use packets and it is appropriate for teens and adults. Um, but I don't think it's appropriate nutritionally for young children. Um, it's not the best at 
mixing with water. It can take a little energy and it kind of smells like vinegar. So you probably not a good choice for someone who's gonna have to drink it. Uh, so I'll just put that out there. I am not aware of the uh, children's formulas though coming in single use packets. Okay. Uh, I, I wish they would, but yeah. What age did your son start using that? Five and X says uh, teen, probably 14, 15. Okay. And only you know when we it's... travel, you know, only when we travel. Okay. I, they want to know how do you spell the name of it so that they can ask their doctors about it? Uh, B I V O N E X. And thank you very much. Theor oh, thank you, Mary Jo. Yeah. Um, theoretically, when you go through security, your medical food should be treated in the same way as infant formula. So if you're traveling with liquid medical foods, they should theoretically be treated the same as infant formula, but it's possible that the agent may not have enough education to understand that there's a reason older people might be on these medical foods. Okay. Um. Can you talk a little bit more about the TSA CARES service? Is it something you have to pay for? Is it something that health insurance covers? Uh, TSA.gov offers this service for free to passengers traveling with um, medical needs, and it's specifically related to the screening process at the airport. Uh, if you need a wheelchair that goes through the airline, they don't do the wheelchair. Uh, but it's specifically related to screening. Uh, anyone can request it for um, a medical need and they do it through that website, tsa.gov and look for TSA Cares. Say you're traveling and you lose your medicine or it gets lost or left behind somewhere. Can your doctors in the US help you overseas by calling in a prescription? Probably not. So that's a good time to panic. <laughs> no, never panic. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but the, this is why duplicates in different bags are uh, helpful, uh, particularly if you're traveling overseas. Your doctor will likely not be able to provide your medicine overseas. Some prescription medicines in the US are actually available over the counter through a pharmacist in other countries. So you could ask the pharmacist in that country if those particular medicines are available. Um, they may not be, they may be under a different name. So it helps to know the generic name of all of your medicines if you think that might you know, end up happening to you. Um, but the best bet is not to lose them in the first place. That certainly is the best bet. Like you said, backup plans on backup plans on backup plans. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Another interesting thing you talked about was how you monitor the temperature in your cooler. How do you do that? What, is, what advice do you have for thermometers and monitoring it? Um, I have a refrigerated or refrigerator thermometer. I believe they're actually designed for medical use for um, uh, medical facilities, but you can buy them on Amazon. Everything's on Amazon, right? You can buy them online. Uh, and they, they're battery run. And I check to make sure my particular needs are under 46 degrees Fahrenheit. And I check to make sure it stays in that range. So do you have like a, is it a remote sensor for it so that without even opening it, you're able to check the temperature? They do sell those. Um, I like one that's not a remote sensor better and I just, you know, bury it a third of the way down and check it periodically. Very nice. But they do sell ones where you can just put a probe in and have it external. Okay. You have been to such a multitude of different places. Have you found that there are some places that are easier to travel than others, minus the traveling by car versus plane side of things? Um, yeah, there, you know, we think through our trips in terms of what's realistic for our family. Uh, I am grateful for some of the trips we took before I went on TPN because I know I could not do it now. Um, for instance, uh, Costa Rica, we went to uh, the rainforest there and we were in a fairly um, 
rugged uh, eco hotel, and I use the word hotel very loosely, uh, with monkeys on the roof and ants in the room. And it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. And it was surrounded by water and there were no roads in or out. So I could not do that now. I mean, maybe I could if I really, really wanted to, but it would be challenging. Um, I think traveling to a city uh, is easier. Europe is easier. The States are easier than traveling to some of the more remote areas of the world. Although I am aware of somebody, I, I don't know this person personally, but uh, who did manage three weeks in Africa on TPN with uh, shelf stable parental nutrition. So I, I'm told it can be done. That's impressive. They, they probably live by your plan, plan, and plan some more mantra. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for all of your wonderful tips and for your help and for everyone's fantastic questions today. We really enjoyed the opportunity to talk with everyone about everything today. We also want to take a moment to thank um, all of our education partners. Um, this webinar was supported today by AstraZeneca, by Bristol-Myers Squibb, as well as by Takeda. And this is just the first in our webinar series about US support. Um, so we're looking forward to even more topics. As you consider the information that you learned today, we encourage you all to enjoy uh, exploring additional resources on our website at fed.org. That's A-P-F-E-D.org. Check out the resources section of the website. Underneath there, you'll find there's both a four patients and a four caregivers section. And under each of those sections, you'll find a wealth of information about traveling. We also encourage you to check out upcoming events and opportunities to get involved in the EOS community. Um, we recently held our annual uh, patient education conference, EOS Connection, and the information and presentations from that event are now available on demand. We also are gearing up for our virtual walk, Heroes Bring Hope. Um, that's gonna be held on August 22nd. We hope you will join us. Um, another great resource um, is our new podcast series, Real Talk, Eosinophilic Disorders. Uh, our first two episodes have been released and there are more in the works. Um, there's just a, a wealth of information on our website and we hope you will use it to help with managing the various uh, eosinophil associated disorders that you all may be experiencing. Another opportunity to learn more and get involved is in an upcoming community webinar on uh, Wednesday. We are a part of a new collaborative initiative called Little Airways Big Voices that is bringing a voice to uh, pediatric asthma or asthma in childhood. And so we encourage you to follow the link on the screen here to join us at, at uh, 3 p.m. on Wednesday for that webinar. Um, you'll see we've got, we are one of four collaborators on this project and we hope you can join us um, if you have experience with asthma in childhood. We also have another webinar in this series already planned and uh, this uh, young man you might recognize from uh, the pictures from Dr. Book's presentation today. Um, we're gonna be hearing from her son, Ryan, um, and he's gonna talk about leading in your own healthcare and provide some great resources and tips for teens and young adults as they start to have their own voice and their own um, power when they're doing their healthcare. So that will be on August 27th at two o'clock PM. We have lots more webinars in the works. And so we hope you'll stay tuned for more information about those in the future. And if you have any questions, please email us at mail at actfed.org. Thank you again, Dr. Book. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Jen. And thank you for joining us. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Absolutely. Have a great day, everyone.